The use of digital devices in education has increased significantly over the past years, and in particular during and after the COVID-19 pandemic and the global disruption in traditional schooling. With the integration of personal digital devices for learning came the increase in time spent by students using screens, either during the lessons or after school for assignments and research. On the other hand, technology integration in schools is argued to offer more opportunities for diversification and personalization of learning and skills development, essential for the digitally transformed society we all live in. Welcome to this episode of European Schoolness new podcast series, where we address different topics around innovation and technology use in education. Each episode delves into a particular issue, and with the help of guest experts, we share insights and evidence and try to present the nuances of the debate at hand. My name is Kostantinos Andronikidis, and today we are exchanging on the topic of screen use in education, and in particular, how this question is tackled in Norway, a country where digital devices are widely used in schools. To discuss this topic and to explore in a more nuanced way the main elements that underpin it, I have the pleasure to be joined today by two members of the Norwegian Screen Use Committee, Niv Nibroin, Associate Professor at the Department of Nordic and Media Studies of the University of Agder, and Anne Manger, Professor of Literacy at the Norwegian Le Reading Center at the University of Stavanger. Welcome both and many thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Thank you. So before we delve into the particular case of Norway and discuss a bit about the approach of the Norwegian government on the issue, you have both been researching for several years the effects of digitization on different aspects of young people's development. So what are we talking about when we refer to digitization of education and why so much controversy about this process in recent times? Yes, uh, thanks Konstantinos for the question. I think it's interesting to see how this debate has changed over the past maybe 15, 20 years in particular. So digitization has been such a broad process that's affected so many different aspects of society and has increased uh, from the outset been about you know providing access to all of the world's information and organizing this access and making it possible um the ideas and the 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 ideals i guess of democracy and collaboration and sharing that were um around uh, the first kind of introduction of this uh, of this uh, process, and then uh, with time, as the digitalization increased, um, we see kind of an increase in commercialization and concerns about how that might uh, affect users, and in particular, then children and young people. And I guess particularly with COVID, uh, when there was a need for the digitalization of education to really um, intensify and increase, so that children could have access to schools at a time when we weren't able to have uh, social or physical contact with. Each other. Um, I think that uh, then the, the process in terms of how education has changed and been impacted happened very quickly and in ways that maybe um, uh, there wasn't enough time to consider kind of the, the consequences or, or the ways in which these technologies would be used. So at the moment, I think in terms of society and the discourse around digitalization, we're seeing a bit of a, a pendulum swing uh, to more critical uh, concerns and questions about uh, where, where have we gotten to in these processes and how might this affect uh, in particular children and young people and their um, their upbringing and, and maybe specifically uh, the educational context that they experience. Mm. And of course it will, uh, yeah, I, I uh, can um, agree to everyone, everything Neil is saying and it will also depend a lot on who you ask, in what discipline, uh, what do you then mean by digitization of education, what do you put in, put in that bag and it's quite typical I think for the discourse and for the debates around this issue that people, whether policymakers or educators or, or researchers or teachers or parents uh, or uh, or kids, teenagers and uh, we ourselves, we put so many different things into that bag. So we tend to unfortunately too often discuss uh, not, uh, not on the same level, not discussing the same uh, same topics or or end up discussing too many topics at the same time so i think it also um it it brings us to the importance of specific specificity and uh and narrowing down and being very precise by what we mean with the digitization which uh dimensions or factors or variables uh are we talking about and uh, i come from 
the fairly uh, circumscribed field of research on reading and even reading of a particular type of text, linear text and reading comprehension. Uh, and even there, if we if we try to discuss the impact of digitization on reading, uh, it very quickly uh, explodes uh, into a too large and too complex and too comprehensive debate. So um, uh, what do we talk about when we refer to digitization of education? We, we If we try to discuss the issue on that level, uh, we end up having not necessarily very fruitful debates. So it takes from, from scholars and from anyone engaging in the debate, it takes a lot of more precision with respect to the terms we're using. Indeed, and I guess the more broad is the debate, the easiest it is to create controversies uh, around it. Um, and yeah, that's that's also part of the, the next question. So there is this hot debate, which is often very much politicized, about the use of mobile phones in schools and about continuing existing bans or even imposing new restrictions in systems where mobiles could be used until now for learning purposes. So what is your view on these moves? And do you think there are valid reasons for such restrictions? Again, talking about uh, reading, which is my field, I think this is indeed a no-brainer. For me, it's a very easy, easy response to this uh, this question. If you if you do want, if we want our children uh, or the children and young uh, young students in school to read, um, and especially now in light of what we see coming out of the big. Um, the international reading assessments, uh, the results on reading and reading as a skill and reading engagement, we need to, to uh, give them uh, the op opportunity to put away their phones or we need to um, create an infrastructure and a context which is conducive to the kind of concentration and sustained focus that reading does require. Uh, and it, it makes it will make it uh, challenging uh, it makes it more challenging with the with the cell phone nearby and uh, that is to me a no-brainer uh, so if we do want to if we do want schools and classrooms to be the kinds of venues um, encouraging reading and they should be given what we see of uh, leisure reading going down as well uh, kids and also parents are reading less in their leisure time hence schools uh, and classrooms uh, will need to become more uh, more central and key locations uh, to encourage reading, and especially the kind of reading that takes time and effort and sustained focus, and to help the young uh, young people to do that, it is a big help if we ask them to put away their phones or if we indeed require the phones to be put aside during during class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, very important what Anna is saying in terms of when we're trying to create uh, environments for con concentration and for sustained maybe focus and for reading. I think it's also an important aspect of this to say, you know, when we talk about ban banning mobile phones in schools, what are we talking about? Because in the Norwegian context, uh, the children's mobile phones would be seen as their own private property or something that they, they bring to the schools themselves. So so they wouldn't, um, it's, it's important to consider then whether they could be used at all in the educational context. And one of the things that then has happened in the Norwegian context is that the very many schools have provided students with their own iPad or, yeah. or learning device um, tablets so that they can use these in, in the educational context. So it complicates the debate even further here. Um, and I think one of the things that we did have a focus around, around the, the banning or uh, the in, introducing restrictions around mobile phone use, uh, which we had here over uh, Christmas and uh, January, early February, the, the question was, should we have uh, restrictions or should we uh, ban mobile phones in the schools? And uh, the, the, the question was interesting timing wise because it was the case that first there were very little restrictions probably when mobile phones were introduced, but as, uh, as uh, teachers and uh, schools were, were getting used to and seeing what the consequences of, of these devices were, then they started uh, introducing uh, restrictions. So there's a huge variation, some schools having no restrictions at all, but others requiring students to leave their phones in a mobile hotel when they came to the school. And this was of course in order to achieve what Anna is talking about in terms of having less distraction and concentration in, in the lesson time. But within that, it's also important to consider that many uh, 
children from the age of nine have their own mobile phone. And this is the way they, that they navigate around uh, the world. This is how they maybe have their uh, bus or train tickets in order to get to school. This is where they might have their school timetable. This is how they contact their parents when they're finished in order to coordinate and organize after school activities. So it's a question, what does that signalize to children and young people when the school says, if the school says, you know, there are restrictions around this or there is a ban, what what are we, t again, it comes back to what are we talking about specifically in what kind of context, um, what kind of educational uh, purposes, if, the, if any, do these devices uh, have? And if not, uh, in what contexts can they be used or potentially be used? And, and in what context are they not fruitful? And of course, then we need research to be able to uh, have these, uh, to support these decisions as well, particularly where you would be supporting a decision to use them in the learning context. Yeah. yeah. Indeed, and we know that it's really hard to find straightforward data about the actual effects of this screen time in general uh, used by students and that we know that the evidence seems to point at different directions based on the context, as you say, the, the research method and the audience involved in these studies. So some education authorities have commissioned special committees um, of experts to investigate this issue and to come up with recommendations for policy action. Um, one of these is uh, set by the Norwegian government, in which you are both members. So what is the objective and mandate of the Screen Use Committee and what is your particular role in it? Yeah, uh, the objective and mandate of the Screen Use Committee is actually very broad. Um, so it's to look at the, uh, the consequences of uh, screens for children and young people's lives. And that's both in the context of everyday life, so outside of schools and activities, how screens influence children's relationships to their parents, to their friends, um, also how they're used in the educational context. So it's a very, very broad mandate. Uh, and as such, the committee is uh, constitutes um, nine different experts from from very different areas. So it's quite a, quite a broad and uh, and uh, comprehensive, I would say, um, a group of experts. So my role in the committee is to. Uh, provide insight, I guess, into research uh, about children and young people's everyday lives. So this is about um, uh, all kind of aspects of life, but maybe mostly that which happens outside of school, outside of the educational context. So how children use screens uh, at home, uh, with parents, with friends, in context of uh, uh, leisure activities and such. Yeah, and my... Uh, my um... My role there is to uh, contribute specifically uh, to uh, what we know about the effect and the impact of digitization on reading. Uh, I've been doing reading on no, research on uh, the effects of uh, the transition from reading on paper to reading on screens, different types of texts for about uh, 10, 10 years now. Um, and I led a, a EU um, funded uh, research network called eread uh, which got a lot of quite a lot of uh, attention uh, and we from 2014 to 2018 where we gathered uh, more than 200 uh, researchers from uh, from more than 30 countries and from a very broad range of different disciplines bringing together the expertise from neuroscience psychology uh, book history media studies literature linguistics anthropology library um, and information science to to kind of uh, collect what we know and to uh, about the differences between uh, reading on different reading different types of texts on different media and we uh, that's i think what started uh, the work towards meta analysis and reviews uh, so collecting the knowledge the research that we now know from empirical uh, studies, experiments, comparing, for instance, re reading comprehension on paper and screens. Uh, and we um, kind of summed up our, our main findings uh, and the status of the research in what was called the Stavanger Declaration in 20, was published in 2019. Uh, where one of the main points uh, was what is now fairly well known, uh, a screen inferiority uh, effect on, um, on reading comprehension. So uh, 
there is uh, a solid amount of uh, empirical evidence that uh, reading comprehension is uh, is better on paper when you read on paper compared to when you read on screens for linear informational text. And then that again is a reminder that we need to keep uh, keep our, our, our terms quite specific in this debate. So uh, one of the bullet points in, um, in the mandate uh, for the committee is uh, to uh, see what we know uh, of the impact of digitization on deep reading in particular. Uh, and this, I think, has this focus has, uh, has been put on the agenda perhaps largely because of the, the decline uh, in reading um, as evidenced in PEARLS and PISA, PEARLS for fifth graders and PISA for 15 year olds, uh, where students in Norway show a uh, drastic decline, uh, not only in reading skill as it is measured in these um, reading comprehension assessments, but also in reading engagement. So uh, leisure reading is going down. Uh, students and parents report to be less motivated to read. They are less engaged in reading. Reading plays uh, a much uh, lesser role as a uh, lesser role as a leisure activity for uh, young people and also for adults. Um, and of course, uh, digitization and the time spent on screens is a, is one of the main drivers in such a development. And given what we know about the um, about the importance and the benefits of of reading uh, as an academic skill uh, for uh, for other academic skills, uh, but also as a way to I think. Um, train uh, train our ability to focus, train our ability to be present uh, in, in a moment without being stimulus driven by, uh, by uh, lights or moving images or um, sounds, uh, these hyper stimuli that we tend to engage ourselves with on uh, screens. Um, reading, uh, it, it's quite, it's, uh, it's got, potentially quite um, comprehensive repercussions uh, cognitively and also societally uh, with such a drastic decline in reading, in long form reading in particular. So um, it's as if now uh, we're going uh, quite far in a negative direction with respect to uh, young people and adults' abilities to deep read, uh, to engage with longer and more complex texts, whether on paper or screens. And, uh, and that is a, an alarm, a wake up call, I think, uh, towards uh, how do we restore that ability uh, and that interest and that motivation with, with young people and um, uh, in today and, and the future of uh, in increasing, in increasing digital future. And um, yeah, uh, it's... Uh, we're going to <laughs> so also go into this... Um, uh, I think uh, in one of the points about the uh, the thematic notes of the screen use committee, we will come mm -hmm. back to the, to the reading and to the effects of that, so we can uh, focus on the evidence there more. But before mm -hmm. that, um, as as mentioned just now, the, the the committee has published two thematic notes with some preliminary reflections and considerations, um, and in those it is suggested that the term screen time should be nuanced. So why is that important, you think? And what are some of the key elements we should consider when we talk about screen time? Yeah, I, I think that this comes back to the what we were talking about a little bit earlier in terms of the need for precision. So screen time is a huge, potentially huge concept. I mean, everything, almost every aspect of our lives has some kind of interaction or some kind of manifestation on screen at this point in time. And this is especially true for children and young people. So we use screens to get information, to navigate, uh, to um, to coordinate our lives, but also for, for to listen to music, to watch films, um, uh, to contact relatives that might live far away, or even just to have contact with the, with family and, and friends on an everyday basis. So, so there are so many different dimensions of this um, that it's really um, it's really difficult to to have a debate, or, or at least it's 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 not possible to have a simplified debate where we can see if the screen is something that's a, that has a positive effect or the screen is something that has a negative effect because we need to uh, break down the context very very specifically and precisely. So, like Anna is saying, where we have research that will uh, show that there's a, 
that there's uh, um, that there are problems with the reading comprehension and that there's a screen inferiority effect in the context of these deep reading of texts. But at the same time, you can say, well, uh, children who find um, uh, friends through gaming and uh, manage to uh, enjoy and have a, have a pleasurable experience and to collaborate and to um, kind of engage around a goal and and all of these kind of things. This this might be something that's very positive. So so I mean, there's so such a vast difference between these two topics as well that it's really um, it's very difficult to to have this concept of screen time and to try to come with a set of policy recommendations around that because it's it's just not precise enough mm -hmm. in any way yeah and again even if you narrow down uh, the debate uh, and discourse to reading linear text and reading comprehension then you can say well a screen is not a screen and paper is not paper because uh, the screens differ according to so many parameters uh, visual ergonomics the difference in light uh, lighting the screens uh, sending out light uh, versus screens uh, merely reflecting lights that you have in uh, in e-readers for instance that are designed specifically to support long-form reading uh, the size uh, of the screens may matter uh, for reading um, um, the fonts, the legibility of uh, the typographic elements, uh, even the weight uh, may matter. So uh, I, I like to think of a very important distinction um, if you talk about reading and discuss uh, the effects and impact of digitalization on reading. We need to uh, at least distinguish between um, the screen versus paper as a substrate for reading, uh, where we are at uh, comparing the displays, comparing paper and the print page, for instance, as a, as a reading, as a display for a text compared to uh, a page uh, on a Kindle or on an iPad or on a laptop or on a, um, on a smartphone. Uh, and then there's the infrastructure. So uh, aspects uh, pertaining to links, uh, the, the, the latent or the explicit distractions that are on a screen compared to uh, on paper. Uh, and then uh, paper is not only paper either, there are differences between and there's interesting empirical research uh, comparing uh, your ability to um, source what you've read if you've read something on a just a sheet of paper uh, printed out uh, say you've read a, uh, a scientific article or a um, feature in a science magazine as a copy uh, on a single page versus or compared to reading this, the exact same text in the actual magazine itself or in the actual textbook itself where you have the context and you have the, the material uh, anchoring of the text itself and then compared to digital. And uh, it finds that uh, indeed... Uh, say the book or the magazine as the object and the material uh, container for the text adds to your ability to, for instance, source uh, the information or also have a deeper comprehension of a text. So, um, so even within uh, screens and paper, uh, those terms, there are finer uh, distinctions that uh, may make sense to make. Um, so to have a more uh, precise and fruitful discussion, I think. Yeah, so it's much more than just screen versus paper uh, in this debate. And going back a bit to what you were mentioning earlier, Anne, about the reading, um, another point that um, the thematic notes refer to is the effect that reading on screens can have for different purposes, types of text and students. So you mentioned a bit about some evidence the Stavanger Declaration, Pearls and, and PISA, but are there, what are the main evidence with regards to using screens uh, versus physical paper for reading? And to what context does this evidence really refer to usually? Mm. So uh, the most solid, uh, solid finding that we have now, uh, which is supported by several meta-analysis and reviews, is this screen inferiority for reading comprehension when you read informational texts, uh, linear informational texts. And uh, the longer and more complex they are, uh, the, the worse off uh, the screens uh, come. And... Um, 
And there has been also meta-analysis specifically on narrative texts because experiments often use uh, a combination of different types of texts. And, and so far, they have not found any uh, similar effect, a screen inferiority effect for narrative texts, which is, I think, uh, interesting. Uh, and also what we miss is uh, experiments uh, using really long texts. Um, so uh, there's the screen inferiority effect and then there's the, the timing issue, uh, which shows that the, um, if you have a restricted amount of time, uh, if, you're, if you're rushed uh, for your reading, uh, that also tends to worsen the, the screen uh, reading outcome. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what is now fairly established as a main uh, insight based on the empirical research comparing uh, reading on paper and screens. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. In, in the thematic notes, uh, there was also some uh, student voices, and we read that students consider technology to be both a disruption and a tool that can support their motivation, interaction, and learning. So what are your thoughts on that? And what does research tell us about the use of technology in the classroom as a tool for learning? Uh, I think one main finding there, uh, I think that it does require, uh, it's really not the solution to give each student just an iPad or, uh, or some digital device and then... Uh, think or hope that they will uh, they will do better on their own. It really takes uh, guidance uh, and it takes a skilled uh, teacher or a peer uh, in order to exploit the, the potential, which is very often said that it is there. But I must say, uh, given the, the big picture now, when we see the decline, not only in reading, but also in, in science and in math uh, in PISA, that this field, uh, digital technologies for learning, is really uh, a glaring example of a field which has been very long on promise and short on delivery. Uh, that uh, it, it's very easy to uh, to claim and to point to the this potential for learning which comes with digital devices, but so far I must say we have seen very little of it, uh, especially or at least with respect to those basic skills and reading, which is so fundamental for uh, for learning across the curriculum, uh, that it's, uh, we need to be, um, be posing more critical questions. And I think we should, in fact, turn the, the, the burden of evidence around to a much larger extent than we have, than we have done until now, and asking for the evidence to show that these digital devices and the software or whatever is the context um, indeed has this potential that we so very easily refer to uh, when it comes to learning across the curriculum. Uh, for sure, uh, for reluctant readers, um, there is certainly there are certainly examples of very high quality uh, digital interactive books, for instance, stories that can that can uh, be entry points to uh, experiencing stories uh, for, um, for uh, reluctant readers or for young children. Uh, but if we, again, if we, if we want to preserve uh, and nurture the ability of young people to be able to engage with text, narratives, uh, stories, uh, which is based on words and sentences and that are not um, audio visuals, we need them we need to train them in reading, bulk reading of longer text, and that is indeed best done on paper. That's what the evidence points to so far, and and there's no, there are no indications uh, that that will uh, change with with in, um, with better uh, digital uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. Neve. Um, I think it would be important to just um, the two things. The first thing was about the fact that what the young people themselves are saying is conflicting or at least seems to be conflicting. On the one side, it can be a distraction. On the other side, it can help them to um, to concentrate and focus. And I think this again comes back to the different kinds of contexts in which screens are used in um, in classrooms and in the educational context. So on, on the one hand, of course, if we have um, a group of students sitting with mobile phones and they're receiving messages about things that 
that are happening either within or outside of the educational context, and that is very distracting. But in other contexts, I know that uh, ch uh, children and young people talk about um, being able to listen to music while they're concentrating on a particular task, and that giving them um, some, some, um, some, uh, I guess, uh, space to to concentrate and focus as well. So I think in both of those contexts, we need more research to be able to understand what is actually happening. The second thing I think that is really important to say is what Anna mentioned as well in terms of um, the, the extent to which the use of these devices in the pedagogical context requires real plan planning and strategy and requires a real um, effort in terms of designing good pedagogical, uh, um, how would you say, uh, uh, structures and, and uh, activities. Because I think what is what the danger uh, or, or one of the, the, the problems with digitalization and the way it has been sold in into many social contexts and, and many aspects of society, I would say, is that it can um, save time and resources. And mm -hmm. therefore that we have this kind of idea that we introduce the screen and that will then, then reduce the number of hours or reduce the number of man hours that are needed in order to run schools effectively or efficiently. And where you then combine that with, uh, with the national budgets or, or local or regional budgets that are being cut back constantly and that have less uh, uh, availability to invest in the educational context, then you suddenly have this promising tool without the resources to to um, really uh, uh, realize the opportunities that it might provide. And then you have the the, the tool, the teachers and the pupils in a context where, where they, they are without maybe the necessary time and resources to be able to maximize the opportunities that could be there. Um, and then maybe without some other resources that they might also need, for example, books, uh, where in some cases schools will reduce the amount of spending on books um, because that the screen can provide access to information and to, uh, to materials that might other, not otherwise be available. But the question is, how, how are these things prioritized? And if you really want to, um, just to come back to that, if you really want to uh, uh, realize, I think, the opportunities that these tools present, then that also requires an investment in terms of uh, planning and strategies as well. Yeah, indeed. Um, so before we close, uh, if if there is something that we, the audience, would keep in mind about this debate on whether the use of devices and the time spent on screens have any impact on students' academic and personal development, what would you say uh, it is? Keep the, the bottom line for me, uh, I come from media studies as well as literature, and uh, each, it's, it's in a way, a no-brainer that too, that each medium uh, and each technology and each device has its uh, very specific uh, advantages and strengths and disadvantages or weaknesses. So it very much uh, will depend on the purpose and the context and a lot of other things. So we need to get away from this one medium fits all uh, thinking that, uh, that I think uh, has been too, um, whether intended or not, uh, it has been, I think, visible in certain um, schools and areas in Norway with the iPad uh, seemingly being the one uh, device because with it you can you can read, you can listen, you can watch, you can write, you can uh, search, you can, it seems to be this fantastic one tool which can replace them all, um, which is, I think, a very, very, um, uh, it's it's a harm, harmful uh, and, uh, and um, unwise uh, way to think about technologies, including the book, uh, the book and paper and uh, pencils and um, and notebooks are our technologies as well. We should not forget that. And they all have their um, user interfaces. Uh, and included in the user interface is not only uh, the audiovisual um, uh, aspects, but also motor aspects. So the way we write differently when we write by hand uh, compared to writing on a keyboard, the way we uh, the tactile feedback, for instance, of, uh, of reading on paper compared to uh, the less tactile feedback from a screen, that we turn the pages differently. We see in qualitative research, in fact, that those dimensions, in fact, play a role. So we shouldn't um, forget that we are embodied uh, human beings uh, where the sensory 
uh, sensory motor engagement with those devices also are part of such seemingly intellectual processes as uh, reading and writing. So uh, all media have their uh, strengths and their weaknesses. They will support certain aspects of, for instance, uh, reading certain types of text better than others um, and uh, try to opt for or st uh, strive for using them in the optimal combination. If you want, again, uh, children and young people to read long form linear texts, which are perhaps a bit complex, they need to have the, the space and the quiet to do that and ideally on paper. So um, schools need more books and um, students need to have the time to read more on paper in schools. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I would agree with that as well. And I would also say that, I mean, it's really important that we um, keep researching these potentials, right? And keep researching the kind of context in which these are, in which these devices are used and, and how the children and young people can benefit from the use of the entire range, as Anna is saying, of the technologies that are available to them. So, so we still have books, we still read, we still write, uh, we also have screens. So, and I think that's, uh, that's, it's important to, um, the one, and yeah, we, we shouldn't be focusing on kind of trying to find one answer, um, but looking at all of the different opportunities that are available. Neve and Anne, thank you very much both for this very interesting exchange and for sharing your insights with us. And we look forward to reading the final recommendations of the committee later this autumn. So if you're interested in topics about innovation and technology used in education, make sure you subscribe to our channels wherever you get your podcast on and follow our work on social media or by subscribing to our newsletter. Feel free to also share your thoughts and comments with us uh, to contribute to the discussion. Soon, European Schoolnet will also publish uh, a new report of its agile collection of information series related to the topic of screen time, where we present a broader view of different national policies and considerations with regards to the screen time debate across Europe. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time. Bye bye.